The simplest electric train in the world to make is the Homopolar Shuttle. These are interesting and entertaining devices to make, and in my first video, I explained the basics of how they work and how to make one. This video, part two, is intended to show uh, how to improve their performance so that they run faster, more powerfully, uh, and more reliably. The most important factor in having a smooth running train is not the train itself, but the track or the coil it runs through. You want something that is very uniform, very smooth, and has as few transitions as possible. A track winder that works very well for me consists of two pieces of 10 foot long, half inch diameter steel conduit. These only cost two to two and a half dollars a piece. The upper one is rotated by an electric drill and the lower one holds the spool of copper wire. What's nice about this setup is as the upper coil is wound, the spool follows its progress from one end of the winder to the other. I use an 11 inch bamboo skewer to keep all of the windings evenly spaced. Once the coil is cut loose and relaxes, this creates a spacing of 9 to 10 loops per inch, which is an ideal trade-off between speed and visibility. The wood holding brackets at either end are just one inch pine boards through which one inch diameter holes have been cut to hold the two long steel poles in place. Winding all the way from one end to the other uses up almost all of a one pound spool of 18 gauge wire. The final nine and a half feet relaxes down to about eight feet when you cut the ends loose and the coil unspools from the uh, metal pipe. Using a winding system like this helps you make very long, even, uniform coils which really helps the, tra the train to run smoothly. Whether you use tape or clips Every union is a danger point in a track because it's very easy for one of the coils to get out of line and block the shuttle from passing. Besides making the lengths of track as long as possible, another technique that can cut down on the number of transitions is to simply solder two shorter lengths together. I usually do so in three at least three equally spaced areas. Apply just a, a little bit of solder to the point at which two coils are touching. Capillary action will draw the solder just to the surface and connect them. I don't recommend making lengths of track much longer than 14 feet. They become so awkward to handle that there's an increased risk that uh, a, a coil could get crushed or bent. Depending on how much you paid for your copper, a 14 foot length of track like this can cost up to uh, $40 and take an hour to make. This is not something you're going to want to crush or get tangled while you transport it or store it. What I've taken to doing is creating a three-sided shelf that I can slide under the track after I've coiled it up, slide it in and slide it out very safely. This is also how I store it for long term and also for transportation. If you've ever untangled or tried to untangle a tangled slinky, you know what a nightmare that can be. So to prevent the loops from locking up together, I use pieces of poster board cut into thin strips to keep the to layer separate. For storage, I use a piece of scrap cardboard on top so that if anything lands on it, the weight is distributed and the uh, chances of the coil getting crushed are greatly reduced. The reason you need to do all of this is that the uh, soft copper wire used for making this coil, these coils uh, is very prone to being crushed and bent because it is so soft. Once I found that for AAA battery 
trains, that the optimum speed was obtained using four eighth inch thick, half inch diameter magnets. Uh, these are N48s. The next thing I tried was to replace this with a single monolithic uh, magnet. This is a half inch diameter, half inch thick N48 magnet. What I found is that this increased the speed or power of the train by about 15 or 20 percent. So having a single large magnet is actually better than a series of uh, thinner ones. N48 magnets like this, uh, this is a typical half inch diameter by half inch long uh, magnet for uh, use on AAA uh, train systems, are very easy to find and they, they work great. But if you want to go the extra mile, what you can do is purchase an N52 rare earth magnet. This is the most power, powerful uh, rating you can find. Uh, these aren't any more expensive than the N48s, but they're more difficult to find. Not as many people carry them. What I found is that on timed runs on a 14 foot long straight piece of track, that these ran about 10% faster. That's not a whole lot of improvement, but if you're doing a complicated setup with lots of ramps, this might help give the extra push you need uh, to make the train go around that uh, in an entertaining way. While the use of a washer prevents or reduces the chance of the front magnet tip tipping and thereby reduces the chances it's going to hit the, the side of the coil and get hung up, it still allows the, uh, the magnet to move back and forth and that's almost as bad. One way to eliminate that is to epoxy the washer to the center of the magnet. What's important is that the center hole be sized to fit the button end uh, electrode, the positive end, of the battery so that it doesn't rattle around too much. An even better solution is to custom make a steel washer Again, with a center hole sized to fit the button electrode of the battery. It needs to be countersunk slightly because there's a little ridge around the base of the button that needs some uh, allowance. The washer should be uh, about 38 uh, thousandths thick, which is the height of the button. I used uh, standard metal strapping from a hardware store, uh, cut and shaped the washer, and uh, then sanded it down until it was uh, the perfect width or thickness. Uh, and again, epoxied it to the center of the uh, magnet. For this to fit flush onto the face of the battery, you need to use an X-Acto knife to trim around and remove just the top layer of insulation exposing the, uh, the metal casing underneath. When this is slipped on, it creates a rock steady base for your front magnet that won't rock or slide back and forth. A faster and equally uh, effective technique is to purchase a countersunk hold super magnet and place it upside down on your primary magnet. It turns out that that hole for a half inch uh, diameter size magnet is an exact fit for the button. What I usually do though is take a, uh, a grinding tool uh, on a Dremel tool and cut a very slight uh, countersink there again to make an allowance for the raised area around the base of the button. This is a very secure system. You get a little bit more magnetism from it, 
but uh, you have more weight and it's also a little longer so there's a greater chance it might jam around the tight corner. One thing I started trying and quickly gave up on was using again a narrow grinding tool on a Dremel tool to grind a hole or depression into the face of one of my magnets and allow it to be the uh, receptacle for the button electrode. I gave up on this for two reasons. First of all, uh, these are made out of uh, rare earths and I'm not sure about the toxicity of those. And when you're using a grinding tool on a Dremel tool, you're creating a lot of sparks and fine dust that you, it's almost impossible not to inhale. The other problem is, is whatever this is made out of, it seems to be flammable. The sparks burn much longer than, say, if you were uh, grinding away on a piece of steel. In fact, when you're working on this, you'll get little tiny sparks that are actually glowing right on the surface. So for those two reasons, I don't recommend trying this technique. It was also very difficult to control and uh, to get a good hole. The magnet can also slide around on the base of the battery. This can be reduced quite a bit by sanding the face of the magnet and the base of the battery so that the surfaces are rough and it won't slide quite as much. But that still isn't a great solution. Uh, what I found is if I took a piece of aluminum from a soda can, which ended up being just about the right thickness, hammered it flat, and then cut a hole in it that was the same diameter as the base electrode, it would create just enough of a shoulder for that base to grab onto because it does extend above the insulation here which you can't cut away or you'll short the electrode out to the side of the battery. Um, there's just enough of a shoulder created to help lock it in place and this is a, a very effective technique to prevent the back end from sliding off to one side. Decorating the trains such as this rocket ship is a lot of fun and uh, kids seem to like it a lot but there is a problem with it and that is that the battery at best is only going to last seven minutes before you have to change it out so don't spend too much time on this. One design that's effective is a spiral pattern like this because as the shuttle rotates as it goes down the track this really emphasizes the rotation. If you do a shaped train, like this one with a nose and a tailpiece, be careful that the nose isn't too long and that it curves fairly quickly. Otherwise, the extra length is going to jam the train as it goes around tight corners. I always use a hemisphere for the front and a fairly sharp, sharp taper for the rear. Action figures such as these help bring a track to life. They all work the same way. A sign or anything you want is counterbalanced with a steel weight on the bottom and a copper or non-magnetic weight at the top. As the train passes under it, the magnets catch it and cause it to spin. For the bearings, I used uh, coffee stirrers, which have uh, very small holes in them and are plastic and low, low drag. Uh, the framework is a piece of uh, copper wire, hot glued to a piece of uh, a balsa wood, uh, very thin that slides underneath. You could also, uh, underneath the track, you could also use poster board. These add a lot of whimsy to the track, and if you're putting on a display for young children, it really makes it pop. I hope you enjoyed this video, and it's given you some ideas for how to improve your simplest train to build. Thank you for watching.